The topic tonight, religious belief and the interaction it has with science, scientific practice, and significantly the theories people perpetrate about and from scientific practice. The format of the evening will be that we'll ask each of the uh, two authors of this book, which has stimulated the event tonight, Questions of Truth, a marvelous title and a significant format of question and answer, and we hope there'll be a, a large part of the evening devoted to question and answer. Our two speakers, Nicholas Beale, who is a social philosopher and, and longtime uh, collaborator with John Polkinghorne, uh, will speak second. And John Polkinghorne, who is, of course, both a physicist and a theologian and a churchman, uh, will be speaking first. They each have different aspects of this issue, which they're going to cover. But I'll invite uh, John Polkinghorne first to speak, and his chosen uh, theme is critical reason and motivated belief. Please welcome John Polkinghorne. Well, thank you very much. The question of truth is as central to religion as it is to science. Religion can do all sorts of things for you. It can strengthen you in life, console you in the approach of death, but it can't really do any of those things unless it's actually true. So the question of truth is of the highest importance. And I believe, in fact, that science and religion are effectively cousins under the skin because both of them are seeking truth through motivated belief. They're obviously seeking different aspects of the truth, and therefore are, there are, will be different motivations for their beliefs. But that's what they're up to. When I, um, after 25 years in physics, um, gave that up and, and um, turned my collar around and became a clergyman and to some extent a theologian, I, my life changed in all sorts of ways, but it didn't change in the respect that the search for truth underlay, underlay both my scientific career and my subsequent career as a priest and a theologian. Now, people sometimes don't see that. They sometimes, people sometimes say that science is concerned with fact and religion is concerned with opinion. And they see a very sharp contrast between the two. But actually to say that, in my opinion, is to make two mistakes. It's to make a mistake about science, and it's to make a mistake about religion. The mistake about science is to think that science simply deals in plain, unquestionable fact. Now, science is more subtle than that. There are no scientific facts that are interesting facts that are not already interpreted facts. We might all be able to agree that the pointer moved across the scale and came to rest at 3.7 or whatever it might be. But until we know what that instrument is capable of measuring, that is really not a very interesting thing to know. And in order to interpret the facts, the face value facts that we encounter, we need theoretical opinion. So, so experiment and theory, fact and opinion, if you like, intertwine in a very subtle way in science, cyclically in a way. We need um, experiments to test and sieve out the, the, the theories. We need theories to understand what's going on in the experiment. So science is much more interesting than simple confrontation of, 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 of un unproblematic fact. Similarly, religion is not simply a matter of opinion. Some of my friends uh, know, of course, that, that uh, religion is based on faith, and their picture of faith is that you shut your eyes, you grit your teeth, you believe six impossible things before breakfast because some unquestionable authority uh, tells you that's what you've got to do. And that makes them, of course, very wary of religion because they don't want to uh, commit intellectual suicide, and neither do I, and I'm sure neither do you. What I'm always trying to do with my friends is to show them that I have motivations for my religious beliefs just as I have motivations for my scientific beliefs. I say they're different kinds of motivations because they're different kinds of beliefs. But they're both there. My friends may or may not think those motivations are adequate. That's a different question. But at least they should recognize that they, that they are there. Now, there are different kinds of motivations because science and religion are encountering different levels of reality. Science has been wonderfully successful. And it has been wonderfully successful, purchased its great success by the modesty of its ambition. It only considers a particular kind of experience, essentially the world treated objectively, the world treated as an it. And that, of course, is what gives science its great secret weapon, which is the, um, which is the weapon of experiment. 
In, if we treat things objectively, then we can kick them around, see how they behave, pull them apart, see what they're made of. And we can do that many times over. If you don't believe what I tell you, what I find when I kick something around, you kick it around and see what you find as well. That gives science its very great power of reaching intersubjective agreement about things. But we all know that there's a great swathe of experience where we encounter reality, not as an it, as an object in that sort of way, but as, if you like, as a thou. We, there's a whole realm of personal experience. And we know that when we move into that realm, the power of testing is highly modified and, in fact, in many ways abolished. If I'm always setting little traps to see if you're my friend, I will destroy the possibility of friendship between us. Because at the end of the day, that friendship can only be based on mutual trust and respect. And it's similarly the case that you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It's not, that's not a cop-out uh, in relation to religious belief. It's simply a fact of the spiritual life. It's no good standing up and saying, if there is a God, let him write me a message on the clouds. God doesn't play that sort of, that sort of silly game. And of course, in this great wide swathe of experience, not just religious experience, of course, but our, our aesthetic experiences, our ethical experiences and intuitions, our interactions with, with, with fellow persons and so on, in that great swathe of personal experience, then we, we, we know that, that, um, that, that, that we cannot repeat things. We never hear a Beethoven quartet the same way twice, even if we play the same disc, because our reaction is always different on each occasion. We perceive something new or affected in some different way. So we, we don't have that power of repetition, which mostly science has. There are, of course, some sciences which don't have the power of repetition. They are the historico-observational sciences, like uh, co physical cosmology and evolutionary biology. There's only one history of the universe that we have to look at. There's only one history of life here on Earth that we are able to investigate. And we have to make the best sense we can of those with the evidence, fragmentary but very uh, helpful, that we have of the, the stages in the, those particular stories. So that's the nearest bit of science uh, to, to, uh, to religious experience or any kind of, of personal experience. And it is certain, to me anyway, it is certain that science cannot tell us all that we need to know. I say it has purchased its great success by simply asking really the question of the process of the world. How do things come about? And it brackets out questions of meaning and purpose and value. That doesn't for a minute mean that those questions are meaningless or not worth pursuing, but it simply means that that is science's self-limited domain of activity. If you were to ask a scientist, as a scientist, to tell you all that he or she could about music, for example, I guess what they would say is that uh, our musical experience is neural response, things far off in our brains, to the impact of sound waves on, on the eardrum. And of course that's true, and in this way it's worth knowing, but it hardly exhausts the mystery of music, it seems to me. That strange, profound fact that uh, that temporal succession of sounds is able to speak to us, and I believe to speak to us truly, of some timeless realm of beauty, which is an important and irreducible part of our encounter with the rich reality, the many-leveled reality of the world in which we live. Science trawls experience with a coarse grain net, and some of the most significant things in our lives just simply slip through the wide meshes of the scientific net. And indeed, some of the experiences of science themselves exceed, or scientists themselves, exceed what science can explain. A fundamental experience, in doing, in doing, particularly in, doing, in fundamental physics, is an experience of wonder. The world is rationally transparent to us and rationally beautiful. The fundamental laws of physics seem always to be expressed in beautiful equations. Not all of you maybe know about mathematical beauty, it's a rather austere form of aesthetic pleasure, but it's a real form of aesthetic pleasure. Those of us who speak the language of mathematics can agree about it and say, yes, that is a beautiful equation.